Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Dustin Portella. Before we get into today's guest, I want to tell you about Dean Skincare. This is the skincare line that I share in my office, as well as Skin Better Science. I'm going to have links to these in the podcast show notes today. And just to remind you that whenever you purchase products from the links that we provide, the revenue helps to support my mission to provide underserved dermatology care to individuals who might not have access to dermatology providers or who otherwise wouldn't be able to afford that care. We take a motor home that's been converted to a mobile clinic and we go out to underserved communities, to uninsured clinics, homeless shelters, and rural places to help provide care where it is needed the most. We don't charge patients for these visits and it's an expensive project. So I want you to get something out of your support. So if you purchase your skincare products through the links that we provide, it does help to support us and I appreciate your support. Now on to today's guest. Today's guest is Dr. John Parente. He's an emergency medicine physician who just entered his 20th year of practice. He spent most of that time as an ER director, and his superpower is seeing a high volume of ER patients while still functioning at a high level and treating patients quickly. Dr. Parente is a mentor of mine, and I rotated with him when I was just a third-year medical student, and his example and his leadership have helped me to become a better physician. He's passionate about healthcare and often uses his own social media platforms to discuss the broken healthcare system to help make improvements in the system and help individuals to live healthier lives so that they need the healthcare system less. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy this conversation with Dr. Parente. Dr. Parente, thank you for coming on the podcast. I'm excited to chat with you. We worked together years ago when I was just a medical student and uh, you were running the ER in Norwalk, Ohio. Yeah, a little Fisher Titus, Norwalk, Ohio. I'll be honest with you, I'm not just saying this because uh, you're here in front of me, but you were the best medical student I ever worked with in my career. So it's an honor to be here talking with you today. So. I, I really appreciate that. And when I went to medical school, my goal was to become an emergency medicine doctor. And along the way, I learned about dermatology and I wanted to go into derm. I, I worked with a lot of different doctors that wanted me to go into their specialty because they thought that I was that was good. And I'm not saying that to brag, but the, the orthopedic doctors there at Fisher Titus, they, they also were encouraging me to go into ortho. And but I, you were the way that you practiced really seriously had me considering going back to ER. And I wanted to go back to the same program that you did. And I interviewed there and everything. I, I like to tell people that it would just became a conversation between 50-year-old me and 30-year-old me about what we wanted to do. And 30-year-old me was like, absolutely, we can do all of this crazy stuff, nights and weekends and holidays. And if you miss a few birthdays, not a big deal. And 50-year-old me was like, hey, just settle down. Let's just think about Durham a little bit more. And eventually, I, I got very lucky to get a Durham spot that was kind of promised to me while I was still a fourth-year medical student. And so I ended up going in that direction, which I'm very happy with my decision, but I think I could have been very happy in ER also. Yeah, you would have done a great job as an ER physician, no doubt. But I can tell you, 45-year-old John Parente really wishes he could have gone back in time and gotten into Derm. <laughs> but for the people that are watching or, or listening, Dr. Parente had a huge impact on me in the way that I practice even dermatology, just because of your bedside manner and the way that you approach patient care in very critical, high-pressure situations when I was a third year and then a fourth year medical student, I rotated with you twice and just watching the way you kept your calm, your composure in some of the most literal life or death situations that patients would face really had an impact on me in the way that I approach patients, even in the dermatology clinic, which is not typically life or death. So uh, thank you for that. And I, I just want those watching or listening to understand the caliber of physician that you are and the impact that you had on me as a physician. I appreciate that. And I tell every student that I've ever had that I'm not the smartest guy in the room by any stretch of the imagination. So I have to dumb things down to make it make sense. But one thing I can definitely do is sort of have that calm demeanor. And the first thing they say in a code is check your own pulse. So yeah. make sure that you're taking that deep breath, preparing, setting up, and then you, you can kind of function accordingly. Yeah. When we talk about ER, emergency medicine, I talk about this in my content on social media. I know you do too, but ER is kind of the catch basin of medicine and it's where people fall through the cracks and they end up in the emergency room. And you see a lot of the symptoms of the broken healthcare system on your doorstep. And I, I just wanted to see if you want to comment on that and kind of the overall trend of healthcare in general and how we've gotten to this point. I think you hit the nail on the head. Emergency medicine, catch basin is a great word. I like to use the term we're America's safety net because when mm -hmm. people have no place to go, they have to go somewhere. And sometimes it's homelessness and people that becomes this huge social problem. 
but there's also medical emergencies or even medical things that are bothering people that aren't necessarily emergencies, but they can't get into their family doctor for three months. So they don't have a family mm -hmm. doctor or their insurance isn't covered. So there's, there are a lot of patients that end up at our front door for a variety of reasons. And one of the best and worst things about emergency medicine is that you take care of those patients at their most vulnerable time. But it's also very frustrating because I'm not a social worker, you're homeless, I'm right. not really sure how I can help you. So it's kind of the best and the worst part of emergency medicine. And I think that's kind of what you're alluding to with your question. Yeah, yeah. And you see these people come in and not that it's the most uh, respectable term, but the frequent flyers and you'll take care of somebody and they're going to be back here within a few days to a week or so because the resources just aren't there for these people out in the community. Because like you said, you're not a social worker and you have a great team of nurses, of people in the ER. You give it your all for a patient. But again, they're just going to fall through the cracks when they go back out there. Yeah. And I, this is something, if you ever listen to my podcast or any of my commentary on social media, I say repeatedly, healthcare is completely broken. It is a broken system. And my only hope is that conversations like this and some of the content that you and I put out there can help people navigate these waters because it is a broken system. And I try yeah. to make sure that's a big focus of mine and try to help patients and, and just general people navigate through there because it is uh, muddy waters to say the least. When we see that people talk about this broken healthcare system, there's kind of two approaches that I look at. And we have the people that are focused on policy, on fixing the system as a whole, whether they're pushing for a single payer system or to reprivatize everything or to go cash pay for everybody because that could bring down the cost by eliminating so much administrative burden. And I think this is such a big ship. It's so hard to turn that around. And there's so many vested interests in squeezing every last drop out of this healthcare system, even though they know it's going to kill it in the end. And I like to take a different approach because I could talk about, and I do talk about some of the problems with insurance companies, pharmacy benefit managers, and all of these. But the approach with my content is more focused on helping each individual to just live healthier so they don't need the healthcare system nearly as much. And my overall perspective with my family, with the people that I'm close to is the fewer interactions that you have to have with the healthcare system from an emergency standpoint or an acute standpoint over the course of your life, you're going to be better off if you can prevent those problems, live healthier now. And what kind of approach do you take on your content? Uh, is there one of those that you're focused on? I mean, that would be a great point and, and, and maybe I should do more of that. But unfortunately, a lot of emergency medicine is reactionary, not necessarily yeah. proaction. So I think you're onto something great there though, because that's th the best way to utilize the healthcare system is to not utilize it, <laughs> as sad as that sounds. But I think you're right. I mean, we don't talk and focus enough about preventative care in this country at all. In mm -hmm. fact, most reimbursers and, and, and payers will put more money on the procedures and things like that after you've already had something happen to you or you've already had pathology, as opposed to looking at putting money towards how do we prevent that. So I don't do a lot of that as far as in my niche. Maybe I should do more of that. I feel like every day I just run around and with a bucket of water and I toss it onto this little fire, that little fire. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the fires are bigger, smaller, but to get out in front of those fires, I think would be huge. And to right. your point about the insurance companies, I mean, they're, I don't know how you fix that problem because they're printing record profits. I mean, you have mm -hmm. United Healthcare is boasting a $400 billion profit for 2024 projection. I could tell you a lot of people out there talk about the physicians and salaries and things like that. Like I haven't had a raise in a decade. I've taken multiple yeah. pay cuts. And just yesterday, Congress passed a 2.8% Medicare cut. We're going down. Our salaries are going down. And it's really sad because to your point, it is squeezing the life out of healthcare. And there's probably not a, maybe a handful of physicians I know that are like not trying to get out right now. Everybody's looking for a side hustle or something to supplement their income or to potentially give them a path out of medicine completely, which it's a shame because we don't focus on primary care. We don't focus on preventative healthcare, which are the things that would actually save us money. I think that it's under 12% of all healthcare spending actually goes to physician salaries. Maybe that figure, it's either 7% or 12%. Yeah. And yeah, so and depending on what you read, yeah, around that number. Not asking for people to feel sorry for doctors that right. we, we still make a good living. We are in the top 5% of earners in the country, but to cut physician salaries is like taking a, a drip of water out of the bucket and expecting it to solve the problems. And it really doesn't. Exactly. And 
especially if we incent our primary care providers with better reimbursements, we get more of the best and brightest into primary care. And that's not to say that we don't have great best and brightest people in primary care, but there's so many people that choose a specialty simply because of the income potential and primary care isn't it. And we do yeah. lose good people to other specialties that could be amazing primary care physicians. And we need to focus on that more, but the insurance companies generally don't own a life of a person for more than a two to five years at the most. So when they're looking at next quarter profits, they're only interested in how can I save money right now? Because if I put a bunch of money into a preventative thing, that person and the money savings is going to end up in some other health insurance company and there, there's no incentive. And that's where a single payer system could have some advantages. But we know when looking at the Canadian healthcare system, the UK healthcare system, single payer does not fix every problem in healthcare by a long stretch. Yeah, I think I'm not a big guy for like regulations. I, I'm very anti-regulation, but I think the only way this works is if the insurance companies get regulated. The problem is the people that would have to do that are all sitting in Washington and all mm -hmm. do receive quite a bit of funding from uh, said insurance companies. So I don't know yeah. if that problem will get fixed anytime soon, unfortunately, but I don't. Yeah, it's, it. it's certainly not promising. So if people can do a better job of preventing health problems through better sleep, better diet. I heard a quote the other day that Americans eat like we have free health care. And this is, you know, partly due to individual responsibility, which is not a, a popular topic in the way that we all choose to live our lives, the things that we eat, the hustle culture that we live in, the poor sleep quality. But also, again, this is a, a thing where the food system has their own incentives to create the most delicious foods that are not good for us. And many people, especially under-resourced communities, they don't have options for great food. And that is contributing to the health problems as well. This is a huge systemic problem and individual responsibility absolutely plays a role, but there is systemic problems as well that need to be addressed. You hit the nail on the head. The No one wants to talk about personal accountability. It, it's really hard to have that conversation, especially in today's day and age in social media, where everything is an attack on someone else. And everyone is very sort of willing and eager to attack somebody with their words on social media, as opposed to like you and I having a conversation. I think people are a little bit mm -hmm. more reserved, but to your point, yeah, the accountability has definitely, or at least my perception, it has gone down quite a bit over the last 20 years I've been practicing medicine. And I do think there are other people, obviously, factors in play. If you look at like obesity, for example, now classified as a disease, but there mm -hmm. are things surrounding that can people can modify, right? And, and that's difficult. But I'll give you an example. The other night, my, my wife and I have been trying to really work hard on, on eating at home and trying to eat well and focused on wellness, like you said. And so my wife went out to the store and she bought, I think she made like a protein pasta dish with some ground up like sausage and some sauce and cheese delicious. I'm Italian. I got to have pasta once in a while. Yeah. And I think she said she spent like $35 on five or six ingredients at the grocery store for mm -hmm. dinner for two of us. Yeah. And I'm like, you wonder why people go to McDonald's and make these other poor choices. A lot of times it's actually cheaper to, to yeah. do that than to eat. Either. Yeah. And it's quick and it's incredibly tasty. It's, <laughs> it's engineered to be that way. Yeah, I remember it was uh, Brady Quinn. I don't know if you remember Brady Quinn played quarterback for uh, Notre Dame and, and mm -hmm. had a little bit of time in the NFL. And he was a big guy as far as like with lifting weights and, and, and fitness. And one of the things that he said, I remember uh, on one of the things I had read about him was that the number of people, as you increase the number of people between the ground and your mouth, as far as processing the food, the worse off it is for you. And yeah. it's interesting that he says, when we go to Italy, I go to Italy a lot, I literally eat more and I lose weight. It's crazy just because, yeah, I'm doing a lot of walking and stuff, but that's not why sure. I'm losing weight. I'm losing weight because there's just fewer preservatives. It's just more natural food, that, you know, it, and it's, it is very delicious, by the way. I'd highly yeah, less it. inflammatory. We, when exactly. the foods we eat create inflammation in the body, it alters the metabolism. It can have an impact on our hormones or so many different factors. Exactly. So yeah. when it comes to the emergency room and we talk about that being the safety net, what I want to ask you, what are the most common preventable problems that end up on your doorstep? What are you seeing over and over that you're like, if we could just fix these little things, we'd cut down on so many ER visits? Yeah. I mean, I think almost everyone that's in the ER is there because they've made a bad decision. <laughs> now, keep in mind, I mean, bad things happen to people that are not making bad sure. decisions. I'm not saying that right. at all. I'm certainly not pointing the finger to, to blame anyone if you get appendicitis. I mean, that you didn't yeah. do anything wrong. But a lot of what we see 
are people that make a bad decision and then they fall or they make bad decisions over 30 years and they have uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, and then they end up having problems related to that, whether it be CAD, coronary artery disease, et cetera. And then you have the patients that are choosing to you know, smoke. And those patients mm -hmm. we see all the time, especially in the summertime when it's hot, they have COPD and they come in and they can't breathe. We fix them up for a little bit and then they come back three or four weeks later and this just sort of goes on the rest of their lives. I mean, there, there are a lot of preventable conditions out there, but to your point, like we talked about before, self-accountability, hey, you got to quit smoking. People don't want to hear that. You got to eat better. You have to exercise more. And people know those things, but they don't necessarily want to take that accountability and, and do it all the time. And that's that can lead to further disease process. Yeah. When it comes to skin problems in the emergency room, I know this is a common thing. I don't do a lot of call in my practice now, but I'm friendly with a lot of the ER docs, the urgent care docs. And so I get phone calls for curbside consults all the time. What are the most common skin conditions or skin problems that you see ending up in the emergency room? It's kind of seasonal, especially like in Northeast Ohio. I think in the summer months, by far and away, we see a lot of poison ivy and hives, mm -hmm. our favorite roost dermatitis, we like to call it. So I think we see that in the summer. In the winter months, it's going to be the viral exanthems. I think that's really what we see, the roseolas and, and that kind of stuff. So we, we do see that seasonally. And I think the biggest thing is, this is why I always teach my residents and my medical students, is that we do see a lot of derm in emergency medicine. Our job really is to recognize the, the dangerous derm. And there's not that much mm -hmm. that is dangerous, at least right away. I mean, melanoma and things like that are very dangerous in not in the one hour that I have the patient in the emergency room. But meningococcemia, for example, I, I've had one case of that in my career uh, on a six month old and that will change your life. I mean, yeah. I remember this little baby sitting in front of me and you could literally see the petechia every couple of seconds, a new one would pop up. That, yes. that, that was a very sick patient. So you have to be yeah. able to recognize sick versus not sick. And then everybody else just gets steroids and Benadryl. Yeah, <laughs> it's enough to get them into the office. Exactly. Do you get people that come in just because they're worried about a spot on their skin? I just, hey, is this melanoma? Does that happen in the emergency room? Not that often, but we do get it once in a while. And honestly, usually it's more of something that's like protruding, like a yeah. lesion on the tongue that's like turning into like more of a mass or like an actinic keratosis or something like that that's like projecting from their head or their scalp or something. So usually we get more of those kinds of things. But I honestly, like I'm very sensitive to this because I know melanoma is so deadly with the high mortality rates. Uh, mm -hmm. Crazy story. We had a physician that worked with us. I don't know if you ever worked with him or not. I don't want to say his name on the podcast, but he he basically was sitting at the desk one day. He's an ER physician. And one of the PAs walked by and kind of looked on the back of his scalp just because mm -hmm. he happened to have his hat off at that moment. And he looked and he goes, it looks like you have a melanoma on your head. And no one had ever looked at the top of his head. He never went for like derm screening or anything like that. And so he actually went to see a dermatologist and he had this huge melanoma on his head that was partly covered by his hair, but he also wore a hat all the time. And so at the end of the day, like he had this huge resection on his scalp. He missed some time at work, but it probably saved the guy's life. So it's just, it was crazy to see that. You just never know when you might spot something if you just are just a little bit more vigilant about it. Even doctors sometimes we're not good at our preventative screenings. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm not sure doctors he's ever going for one make the worst patients. Yeah. Very interesting. Since we're in the summer, it's super hot here. I think we hit 108 yesterday here in Idaho. If somebody gets a terrible sunburn, how would they be treated in the emergency room? Because they're more likely to go to you when they've got blisters all over their body, they're weeping, they may have a fever, they might be dehydrated. When we're on that borderline of sometimes people call it sun poisoning, heat stroke, heat exhaustion, what would be a treatment protocol for somebody going through that kind of a scenario? Yeah, so I think when we see sunburn, we get we, we kind of get a little frustrated in the ER because it's obviously not someone who's having a heart attack. It's not someone that flew off their motorcycle 60 miles an hour. But at the end of the day, they these patients still need to seek out care. There's not a ton that we can do in the ER for someone with simply sunburn. Mm -hmm. Yes, we'll do things like tell them that they need to put topical lotions on. I'm a big fan of Aquaphor for just about everything in life. I think it's cheap. It's great. It has very few side effects. So we do sort of recommend a lot of that. People come to the ER with the expectation of getting something like solar cane. I know I'm not familiar with dermatology literature, but I can tell you in emergency medicine literature, it doesn't really show that there's any benefit to it whatsoever compared to topical Aquaphor or those types of agents. 
sometimes you do get into that area where you have dehydration. And so of course we're recommending hydration with those folks, but then you start to cross into the, could this be heat exhaustion? And that's, that is truly something that is more emergent. Those patients will most likely end up getting labs and getting <coughs> IVs. And then you get into heat stroke, which is definitely mm -hmm. an emergency. That doesn't happen too often, thankfully, because I think people start to recognize like, hey, I'm not doing well in this heat. I need to yeah. leave the heat because that's obviously treatment step number one. Yeah, get yourself out of the situation. Exactly. Yeah. Do you see a lot of that and in your practice as far as the, sun, the um, sunburn? What else? Do you do anything differently? No, we don't see a lot of acute sunburns. I have so many patients though that come in for their skin check and they're peeling because they had a burn on vacation a week ago or so. And I always give them a hard time. Like this is, you come to your derm appointment with a sunburn or with peeling. It's like going to the dentist right after eating Oreos. And I just, I have to give them a hard time. And they all know I almost canceled, but I decided to come in. And it That's is so one of those things that Hey, it can happen to anybody, even as a dermatologist, I've been caught off guard and missed a spot on the back of my legs or something with sunscreen. So it can happen. But when they come in and their whole back is peeling, I'm like, no, you can't do this. You had a melanoma. Come on, you know better. So. And I think sometimes I get lulled into like this false sense of security because I'm Italian, my skin's very dark. And, but it doesn't really make it any less likely that I could end up with a skin cancer either. I want to go back to one thing you said when we're just talking about heat stroke or heat exhaustion, that most people recognize that they're not feeling well and they get out of the heat. They put themselves out of the situation. And I think this is kind of a thing where more people need to think about, not just with respect to the heat, but for lots of different emergencies that a lot of times something's not right before the event happens. And if you can listen to your intuition on that and remove yourself from the situation, a lot of problems can be prevented. And, and the example that comes to mind for me is just two weekends ago, I went with a friend to see Theo Vaughn's comedy tour in Idaho Falls, Idaho. And afterwards, we went out to this little restaurant, we grabbed a slice of pizza, and we're sitting outside on the corner by an alleyway, and a fight breaks out right in the alleyway behind us. And two guys are throwing haymakers. And I watch one guy pull out a knife and he's holding about a six inch blade and he's swinging at the person. And right then I was like, I'm way too close to the situation. I'm just gonna walk away. And I walk down the street. I'm not gonna jump in. This is not my fight to fight. Somebody, I know people are already on the phone with 911, so I can't contribute here. And I don't make it to the end of the block before I hear five shots ring out. And so the person that had pulled the knife ends up going back to their car, getting a gun, and they shoot the person five times. And then after another five, six seconds, you hear a sixth shot ring out. And just by simply recognizing this is not a situation I want to be close to, and I get myself out of there, it prevents me from being caught in the crossfire in the background because somebody that's angry and shooting, they're not looking what's behind their target or anything like that. I've never been... Even in the ER working with you, I don't remember any gunshot or stabbing victims that came in at the time I was there. And it happens in little old Idaho Falls, Idaho. But I think we all have been in situations where something goes poorly and we think back and you're like, yeah, I had a bad feeling about that before it happened. And I probably could have gotten away or corrected something before that moment. And I'm sure you see that every day in your practice. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad you made it out of there. Okay. It, you always think we're all guilty of it, right? Like it'll never happen yeah. to me. I'm not going to be at the bar at two o'clock in the morning. I don't need to be worried about that kind of stuff. But now this stuff, I mean, it happens during the day. It happens mm -hmm. in Idaho. It happens in Northeast Ohio. Yeah. I think listening to your gut in those types of situations, whether it be that or getting yourself out of the heat or getting yourself out of the cold or avoiding a conflict like that, getting yourself out of the bars before midnight. Nothing good happens after midnight, unless you go to Taco Bell. And that's actually probably a pretty bad decision too. <laughs> For lots but, of other reasons. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it seems like a good idea until 15 minutes later when you're like that. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but I think they've actually studied this and the whole being able to diagnose somebody with a medical problem. One of the most sensitive things out there in the world is a gestalt, which is sort of just yeah. your gut feeling. And obviously your gut feeling was right, thank God, not that long ago where you were just like, I need to get out of this situation. And I, I talk to my kids about that all the time. I just talked to my kids last night about this. And I'm like, you're gonna be put in situations where you're not comfortable. And I know you wanna be tough and think, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna tough this out, this whatever the situation is. But it's actually a lot tougher to have the strength to walk away and just say, mm -hmm. this isn't good for me. I need to exit the situation. 
Yeah, that's where good parenting comes in too. And that is probably another thing that's underappreciated. And my kids are still fairly young. They're not at the ages where they're going out to parties or anything, but and staying out all night. But I've always told them, same thing my dad told me, is that if you are ever anywhere and something's not right, you're uncomfortable, you call, I will come pick you up. I will drive as long as it takes to get you and get you out of that situation. You can blame it on me, I'll be the bad guy and say that I'm coming to get you and you're in trouble or something, whatever you have to say, get out of exactly. that situation. And, and I think that it does, it takes more courage to walk away from something and not go along with the crowd. And that's an important message, especially for some of the younger viewers and the listeners is that your life can change in a moment. And if something doesn't feel right, you're never going to regret getting yourself out of that situation. Even if nothing ends up ever happening, you're going to be better off if you trust your instinct. And the more you trust your instinct, the more in tune with that you're going to become. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's a great point. We have a phrase that we use. We, so that if the kids ever call me on the phone and say, hey, when are we going to Vegas? Then I know that's the phrase. So, so that way they don't have to say anything in front of their friends. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good idea. A little secret code so, word there. Plus I love Vegas. So I love Vegas too. I got to meet you in Vegas sometime. <laughs> One of these times. Let's do it. I want to jump back to some skincare problems in the ER. Yeah. There was a patient that I remember seeing with you who had attempted hair removal in the nether regions by using Nair. And Nair can work really great on the legs. It should be avoided on the face. But for whatever reason, maybe he had a date coming up. He put Nair all over the genitalia, the area between the anus and the genitalia, and left it on way too long had a significant chemical burn, like second degree burn down there in so much pain, red, raw. I mean, it looked like you turned into a baboon all over down there. So when it comes to issues like that, hair removal in the nether, uh, these other accidents or things you've seen, people get carried away with their intimate grooming. It's funny you mentioned that case because I actually had forgotten that case until you brought it up because I'm old now I forget everything. But I do remember that case now. And yeah, hopefully he recovered okay. Probably not in time for his date or whatever was Probably happening. Not. But, but yeah, I mean, and, and all joking aside, I mean, that's a pretty sensitive area, not just from a pain standpoint, but if you're diabetic, I mean, that's where you get into mm -hmm. some Fournier's gangrene and some more dangerous infections there as well. But yeah, I mean, w w more commonly, I think what we see are burns from laser hair removal. We start to see these med spas popping up left and right. And we have people that really don't have a lot of training in using those lasers. And then they end up burning people. And we've seen some pretty nasty burns, honestly. Mm -hmm. And then we end up usually just referring them outpatient to like a burn center and try to treat mm -hmm. the, the wounds. But we do see that from time to time, although not quite any of those cases, not recently that we saw back when you were training with me. Yeah, it, it is something consumers need to be aware of that it is actually pretty darn easy to buy a laser. If you have somebody as a supervisor, some states don't even require that. You can just be an LPN or some places even a medical assistant. If you just open a business that's a med spa, there are companies that are a little shady. They'll loan you whatever amount of money on ridiculous terms. You can buy or rent a laser and people get themselves into situations where they don't understand the settings of their laser, or they think right. that, oh, these settings worked on this person, let me try it on this person, but their skin type is darker and they are gonna suffer burns. When people are seeking out laser hair removal on any part of the body, it's important to go to somebody with significant experience in that, preferably a board certified dermatologist, board certified plastic surgeon. Those are the places where they're gonna have medical malpractice, liability coverage, some of these other med spas, they open and close all the time and you could be left high and dry without any recourse if you suffer a complication. And I've seen that time and time again, people come in after the fact that they've suffered a consequence, whether that's from burns of laser hair removal, aesthetic lasers, and even problems with Botox and fillers that yeah. they've suffered consequences from poorly trained individuals who are really just in it to make a quick buck. And they're not really there because they love the the treatment of the patient and making people's lives better. Yeah. And then you get some of these places that are offering their Groupon specials, right? They're just trying to get people in the door. They're offering $7 Botox and you're like, who's injecting me? And 
it's interesting you say that because you don't even have to have any sort of certificate or anything to inject Botox. I can finish yeah. residency today and tomorrow I can order a vial of Botox and just start injecting people. It's crazy. Yeah. Now, I mean, obviously they recommend you go to a course, but you don't have to. I generally, when people come to me and they have a filler complication, the number of times that I've said, where was this done at? And they're like, oh, I just went to a friend's house. They were hosting a Botox yeah. party and I got some filler. I was like, all right, who was your injector? And they're like, I... I don't know. It was just whoever was there. Do you know what they injected? So I know if I can reverse it or not. And they're like, I don't know what it was. And I think maybe there's some exceptions to this, but I'm like, if you're just like at somebody's house and somebody you don't know comes up and offers you a pill and you don't know what it is, most people are going to be smart enough not to take that. I'm sure there's some people that are like, yeah, give me whatever, but that's not a good idea. And they'll end up in your ER also. But yeah, for sure. people are doing this because they are at a friend's house. They're getting something injected into their face. They're getting a procedure done. They don't even know what it is. They don't know who's doing it. And they just put this trust that it, everything is going to be okay. And there are significant complications that can happen that I see in my clinic. And some of those may end up in the ER from time to time if they've got a occlusion from filler. And people need to be educated on what can go wrong before they do some of these cosmetic treatments. Yeah. And a lot of times these turn into social events, right? Like we're drinking mm -hmm. wine, we're having a good time. Hey, I'm going to this person's house because there's a Botox party. And it just, it sounds fun. It's, it, it kind of creates this sort of vibe that like, oh, this is really cool. There's six girls that are going from work and they want to go get it done together. And so, I mean, it, and of course it's always discounted or there's going to be mm -hmm. some sort of promo attached to it. So yeah, it's a... Uh, it's strange. I've actually been at some of those previously. I did have some experience with working with a, a med spa previously, and I never really liked the the home situation. I, it, mm -hmm. It's always sort of felt off to me working in the hospital for so many years where you have cleanliness, there's the right tools that you need, you have the proper cleaning supplies and just the stuff that you take for granted, cotton balls and band-aids and just stuff like that, that you just mm -hmm. need appropriate lighting. These houses are never going to have the lighting that we have in the emergency room. So it no. always just felt off to me. I never really enjoyed that part of it. Yeah. I think we've all heard you can't eat the food at everybody's house. You certainly shouldn't get your cosmetic injections at anybody's house. <laughs> yeah, that's good life. Good life advice. If we step back to the grooming, yeah. I think this is just kind of a fun conversation to have on intimate grooming. This is anybody that's probably under 50 years old is now shaving down there, both men and women. From my perspective, this is it's just cultural. It's just a social thing. People don't need to do it. We evolved with pubic hair for a reason. And uh, people are now removing it because of Hollywood movies, other forms of entertainment that we don't need to go into. And there's right and wrong ways to do it. Any tips from your physician perspective? I'm glad we're talking about this because I think that this is a difficult thing for people to discuss. It's kind of a sensitive topic. And I feel like probably people are afraid to approach either their providers or maybe they're talking to their friends about it. I'm not sure, but it is a difficult topic. But I do think it's important. I did a little bit of research for the podcast. It looks like according to Cosmo, they did a poll. 69% of people are doing manscaping as far as men are concerned. And that's just the people that are admitting to it in a poll. So I, there's a large percentage, like you said, of people that are doing this. And mm -hmm. it's like I tell my students a lot of times, there's a lot of right answers in medicines. There's probably a lot of right ways to do this. But the, the key is to really know the wrong ways and try to avoid those for sure. Mm -hmm. I did read that as, as many as uh, up to half of the people that have done the manscaping and grooming in the past have had some type of an injury. And actually up to 2% of those patients ended up in an emergency room with either a cut or something like that. Obviously something that you want to try to avoid. There's all kinds of different tools out there that are available. I think the first thing that you look at is the difference between electric versus razor. Have you noticed mm -hmm. anything as far as staying away from one of those versus the other in your practice? I think I... I recommend, and people ask me, not infrequently, the best way, I tell everybody, don't use a razor down there. So the hairs are all coming out at different angles, they're very curly, and the skin is not taut like the way that it is on your face. So it's not easy to just take a razor and go over the skin down in that area. And so the risk of cuts, scrapes, and the increased risk of infection is right. much higher if you're using a blade. And people don't understand of course, that we everybody knows we have bacteria that live on our body, but the type of bacteria that live 
in the nether regions is very different than the bacteria that live on your arms or your legs. We have completely different bacteria that live around our ears than anywhere else. And if you get a cut or a scrape, you're much more likely to get an opportunistic infection in that area because we have a higher concentration of E. coli, all the bowel bacteria, regardless of how good you are with your personal hygiene, you have more potentially pathogenic bacteria down in that area. So I recommend that people use electric and don't, there's just generally not a need to take it all the way down to the skin and have a clean shave like you might seek out on your face. Use a guard that protects the skin and you can remove most of the hair, but it, this is my recommendation to patients, it doesn't need to be down to bare skin. I don't know why you'd really want that either in the hot summer months, but hey, that's personal preference. Yeah, that's a fair point. And that's something that I do see a lot in the emergency room, especially with more frequency now that this is sort of more obviously mainstream, but we do see a lot of the infections. We see a lot of the folliculitis and abscess formation for sure. And that's one of the conversations I have to have with these patients a lot of times. Look, you have an abscess now. We had mm -hmm. to cut it open. We're putting you on antibiotics. Like you can't be shaving here for a while. And yeah. when you do resume after everything's healed, like you have to be uber careful because now you're probably at risk to have this happen again as well. And you can develop yeah. scar tissue and things like that. I'm more about that than I do, but we do see that in the ER for sure. Also, whenever you have something like that happens, you could be left with scar tissue or inflammation that can persist for a long time. And I deal with patients that have rashes like psoriasis or eczema that can happen in the groin. And even though these are not contagious conditions, it impacts their intimate life because if they're with a new partner, they might think that it's a sexually transmitted infection or that they're going to catch something or that this person's not clean. And if you're with a new partner and you have scarring, it can create a perception that you've had something in the past. So you do have to be careful with this. One is just not fun to have that kind of thing happen, especially down there. But two, it can have long lasting social implications for you. Yeah. And the other thing you have to think about too, is the differences in races. I've seen a couple of patients that have had that type of sort of micro trauma or a little bit of trauma from the shaving and then developed keloids, which obviously very difficult to get rid of. Even if they're small, it can impact your perception of your appearance, yeah. which can affect you not just physically, but also psychologically. So I do think that's something that probably see more of now that is sort of something that everyone is kind of doing right now. Yeah. I think that it, it may be purely marketing, but the company Manscaped, which they're not sponsoring this podcast in any way, shape or form, they've got great marketing, but I think that they actually make a pretty good device. They have guards that can go on it and they use a ceramic blade, I believe, instead of a metal blade. So the risk of getting skin caught in there and getting a cut is lower from what I understand of the technology and they market, they're not the cheapest thing. You can get generic beard trimmers and just keep a guard on it so that you don't have that metal going right against the skin because with all the skin folds and everything, you're much more likely to catch it. And then it's gonna be like that scene from what, there's something about Mary, <laughs> you're bleeding. And so we wanna avoid that at all costs. Yeah and not end up in the emergency room, not end up in wound care, not end up at the dermatologist office for something that is preventable, which is kind of full circle back to the beginning of the conversation that you can prevent problems by just being smart before you start something. A little bit of common sense goes a long way, but you know, common sense, as they say, not so common anymore. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, what do you recommend anything in particular for either a pre-treatment, uh, obviously other than showering and making sure that you're removing a lot of the bacteria mm -hmm. or even post for people that are shaving? Is there something that you would recommend for that post-shave sort of treatment care moisturizer? I generally don't think people need to go buy something super special just to clean that area. I am friends with several OBGYNs and there's a whole market for feminine washes and products that can end up altering the pH of the female area. And that can lead to yeast infections or other complications. Right. You don't need to do that. Generally, a fragrance free body wash that's going to remove excess dirt, oil, sweat, and overgrowth of bacteria, you're going to be fine using that. If you want something that has a little fragrance and you're not allergic to it, by all means, you can certainly do that. I like the Dove Men Care Plus line of body washes. They have some with or without fragrance. And I recommend that to my patients quite frequently 
depending on what their preference is for fragrance. And that's going to do a good job to clean the area with excess bacteria. Now, if you're prone to folliculitis or shaving bumps, or you tend to get little infections, you can wash with an antibacterial bar soap. You can even get Hibiclens, which is a pre-surgical scrub we use in the operating rooms or even before procedures in my office. It's a pink soap. It is carried at most pharmacies. And I recommend this to a lot of patients with a condition called hydradenitis, where they're just subject to recurrent boils and cysts in the armpits, the groin, sometimes under the breast of women. And this can help to remove pathogenic and even normal skin flora to decrease the risk of those infections getting in under the skin. So that can be an option. If after shaving, whether it's in the groin, the back of the neck or the face, people are still getting folliculitis, Sometimes I'll prescribe a clindamycin lotion. It's a 1% topical antibiotic, and this can be a really good job as an aftershave type product. And if that still isn't enough, sometimes we'll go to what's called desonide lotion. It's a very mild topical steroid. It's not something you want to be reliant on forever, but if you can help calm down that inflammation over the period of a few weeks as a post-shave product, then hopefully we get the skin to reset and you don't have to be reliant on that product over the long term. That definitely sounds good. I've not tried the Dove, the Dove's line. I'll try that. That, that sounds like a good winner. And I've definitely not tried the Hibba cleanse, but that makes sense with the, the hydradenitis suppurativa. Mm -hmm. We get that a lot in the emergency room. So maybe I'll mm -hmm. start adding that to my repertoire for those patients. Yeah. I, I see good results on patients with hydradenitis as long as it's not real severe. If they've got severe scarring, multiple sinus tracts, connecting with multiple openings, they're going to need more systemic treatment. But if they're the kind of patient who gets one or two boils a month in different areas, a lot of times just with improved hygiene with something like HIBA, they will see a reduction in the number of lesions. And if it escalates from there, then we can get into more systemic treatment options. There's only two that are approved by the FDA now to treat hydradenitis, but we use a lot of different stuff off label. Yeah, for sure. I wanted to talk to you about, obviously, your presence on social media is uh, very impressive, very flattering that you're having me on the show today. So I'm very grateful for that. But I wanted to tell you about, I got into this for, for a couple of reasons. One was because I saw that the impact you were having and the success that you were having. And I thought maybe I could partake in some of this content creation, try to bridge the gap between the regular world and the medical world, which there's often a disconnect. But I wanted to share a story with you that I thought was pretty cool. I had a case uh, recently where I had a patient that had uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, and it wasn't a straightforward case at all. Carbon monoxide, obviously odorless, tasteless, you can't see this gas, and it was in this winter. And this guy came in with chest pain or something along those lines, and we worked him up and everything was negative. And I just, there was just something on him that triggered my gut feeling that this may have been carbon monoxide. So I go back and talk to the patient. It turns out that he had been uh, using the space heater and had it cranked up really high in his house. And I don't know why I was able to be lucky enough to go back in there and ask him, but then I came back, I ordered the carbon monoxide level. And even two or three hours later, that level was way high. It was like almost 30 mm. or 20, it was very high. It was a toxic level. So that was the diagnosis yeah. that was causing his chest pain. I did a uh, video after the fact to kind of summarize this case and just talk about it very briefly. It wasn't a, a podcast, it was just a short on social media. And what's interesting is about three days later, the unit clerk from the secretary came up to me and said, I'm so glad that you did that video because my son's been sleeping with a space heater in his room for the last couple of weeks or months. And he's been having crushing headaches. He's been lethargic. We've taken him to the doctor a hundred times and no one could figure out what it was. I watched your video and I went to the store and I bought a carbon monoxide detector because we didn't have one. And I mm -hmm. plugged it in. The minute I plugged it in, it read registered high. We had the fire department come out and basically they realized that it was from the space heater. And she basically was like, you really saved him. I didn't save yeah. his life, but I mean, it, they definitely saved him from something. And so I just think I want to bring that story up because number one, it's kind of a cool story. And number two, I think a lot of the work that you're doing and a lot of the work that I'm trying to do with a lot of this, it, it does sometimes really actually impact people. And I think that's why we're both. Here. You probably did save his life. That could have gone on repeatedly. And whether he dies in his sleep because of carbon monoxide poisoning or he just passes out from fatigue while driving the car and gets in an accident, you made a significant impact on that individual. So I, I think that's phenomenal. And 
it can be so rewarding to be on social media when you get moments like that. But there's a lot of time in between where it feels like a slog. Again, not asking anybody to feel sorry for us, but when you put a lot of work into a video and you get maybe a thousand views, 2000 views, you think, right. oh, that's not even worth it. But I always like to think, what if somebody invited me to come speak to a thousand people in an auditorium? That's a huge opportunity. And the right. chances that you'll make an impact on a few of those people is really high. So if you get, even at this point in my career, if somebody said, hey, I got a group of 500 students you can come talk to, I will take that opportunity pretty much every time to go make an impact. And when we have videos that reach into the millions, that's so fun. And the potential for impact and good is really high, but it only takes one person to make a difference in their life. And I know that you feel this way is that when you are sitting across from a patient and you have that one-on-one -on -one physician patient relationship, it's to me, one of the most sacred relationships that any individual can have. We're trusted to violate people's bodies and we can have that impact day to day, but it's always a one-on-one. -on -one. And the fact that we can step out of that role from time to time, create content and potentially impact hundreds, thousands, and sometimes millions of people is really pretty cool because it goes back to that broken healthcare system where people can't get care. They don't get good education in the school system on how to take, take care of their health, or they're getting misinformation from lots of different sources. And it's really amazing to have that impact. And I encourage any physician that has a desire to, regardless of your specialty, to get on and start teaching because you will have an impact, even if your videos are not reaching in the hundreds of thousands of, or millions of views. I plan to continue to work in the emergency room and, and help those patients that are at their greatest need at that moment. But I do think with some of the content that we're creating, some of the things we're doing, my podcast, which is Emergency Minute, I think those are the things that I'm trying to do to see if I can help people even outside of the emergency room that maybe at some point with enough reach may even have a, a bigger global impact than the, the work that we're doing in the emergency room. Absolutely. And we're going to link to your YouTube, your podcast. I would encourage anybody to listen to that because again, to reiterate, Dr. Parente was very pivotal in my career as a physician and the way that I want to treat people. His approach to education is top notch and his kindness and interaction with patients is as good as they come. And I don't know why you chose to take me under your wing as this green third year med student, but it really had an impact on me. And that's why we've stayed in touch. I can't thank you enough for that. I appreciate the kind words. I don't feel deserving, but I do appreciate that. And like I said, you were the best student I ever had. So I really pushed hard for you to get into emergency medicine, but I think you made a very fine choice helping people like you are now, especially with that mobile unit that you guys are doing. It looks really awesome. So I love to follow you and love to see you achieve success and, and use that to help other people. That is my ultimate goal is if I could get to the point where I can just work for free, give free care all day, every day through the mobile clinic and support that through social media, that would be my dream is to just go give care to people who can't afford it, who would never have access to it otherwise, and use that as a platform to teach and reach even more people. So it's a passion project and I'm, I'm really grateful that it's being well received on social media and in the communities that I go to. What a great thing to aspire to do. I certainly wish you well and if I can help or do anything on, on my level, I'd be glad to, because it's, uh, it's really cool to see that in a day and age where people are just trying to get theirs a lot of times. And I get it. I mean, inflation's high, tough, tough times right now, cost of goods, cost of services, but to see somebody out there like yourself that they're just treating patients for the, the love of treating people and making an impact on their lives is really admirable. Thank you very much. Dr. Parente, if people want to find you on social media or your podcast, give us a plug. Where can they find you at? All my social media platforms are all at Dr. J. Parente. So it's all just one word. I'm on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. My podcast is called Emergency Minute, and that's everywhere you receive your normal podcasts. Our biggest mm -hmm. two are going to be Apple and Spotify. And we'll make sure we have links to those down in the video description. And uh, I think that we'll have to do this again. There's so many topics we could address and it, it's such a great time to visit with you on the podcast. So I look forward to doing it again. Yeah, I definitely would do that again. I didn't know that we were going to go from like emergency medicine to shaving scrotums, but you know, we went full <laughs> circle and <laughs> I had a good time with it. So I, I, I appreciate it. And actually, I want to come out and visit. I was talking to the wife. We'll come out and visit soon. Yeah, we'd love to have you. We'll have some fun. All right. Sounds good, man. We'll see you next time. Perfect. Thanks, Dr. Prente.